Taiwan is really that crisis right now, right? And if we could build, obviously, a metaphorical wall across the Taiwan Strait and prevent an invasion uh, of Taiwan by China, then we could actually stabilize the Cold War. It wouldn't end. We still have this global competition for supremacy that plays out in every corner of the world. But Taiwan is really that one place where we might go to war with China over because of, of the critical um, reasons uh, why Taiwan is important to us. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually, you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Change Agents and Ironclad Original, presented by Montana Knife Company. Today, we're going to be talking about China, the potential that they could invade Taiwan, the impact that, that would have, how that could potentially spark another world war, and whether or not it could be prevented. Can it be prevented? How would it be prevented? My guest today to discuss this is Dmitry Alperovich. His latest book, is titled World on the Brink, How America Can Beat China in the Race for the 21st Century. Let's get into it. You know, I think most people have heard of Taiwan. They know that there is a tie, what, what tie they may think it be, a direct tie, an indirect tie to China. Oftentimes they're used in the same sentence. I would say the vast majority of people and I'm going to include myself in this, don't have a depth of knowledge in what the link actually is, where it comes from, the history of both. And maybe that's the best starting point to enter into this conversation. If you want to, or if you could, please kind of just provide some background history and context of Taiwan and its relationship to China and how maybe it's inception and just bring us up to modern day on where we're standing with those two. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me on. The first thing that people need to understand is that this idea that Taiwan has always belonged to China is nothing more than Chinese Communist Party propaganda. It is historically not true in the same way that it's historically not true that Ukraine has always belonged to Russia, as President Putin likes to claim. In fact, the similarities between the two authoritarian leaders in Russia and China and their uh, desires for conquest over their neighbors is remarkably similar and really what led me to, to write this book, World on the Brink. But first of all, Taiwan, uh, the native population of Taiwan, the indigenous population, is not Han Chinese. They're Austronesians. And for much of Taiwan's history, um, they really controlled the island. And even though there were attempts at numerous, uh, numerous attempts to invade Taiwan by the Dutch and the Portuguese and, and ultimately Japanese and, and the, China, the mainland Chinese, uh, almost no one was really successful um, until the Japanese in the 1890s uh, when they uh, established full control over the island and occupied it till the end of World War II. And in fact, there's an, an incredible story that I cite in the book of a U.S. merchant marine ship in the 1860s uh, shipwrecking on the island of Taiwan and encountering the native tribesmen, again, who are not Han Chinese. And these tribes uh, were very uh, uh, aggressive toward, towards uh, foreigners, in part because of the various attempts at invasion, and they basically slaughtered the, the U.S. Um, uh, party that um, uh, landed on the island. And as you might expect, the, Washington issued a formal complaint to the Chinese emperor because ostensibly, you know, the Chinese empire had control of Taiwan. And the response that they got back from the Chinese emperor basically said, we don't really control these wild people. You're welcome to do whatever you want with them because uh, they're, they're wild and you know we ha we're in a few places, but we don't really have full control over the island. An incredible admission, right? Uh, and, and in fact, the Japanese in part decided to fully invade the island because they were encountering the same things when they were shipwrecking on the islands. They were encountering this, these aggressive tribes that uh, they would get in conflict with and they finally got fed up with it. The Chinese did not help them, and they said, we're going to take this place over. And uh, they modernized the country. They built a lot of the, the architecture. Uh, a lot of the culture there is very heavily influenced by that period uh, from the 1890s to, to 1945. 
And then in 1945, of course, Japan loses, and the Allies, uh, the winning Allies, decide to transfer Taiwan to the Republic of China, uh, which at the time was Chiang Kai-shek. But of course, at that point, Chiang Kai-shek, the, the Chinese nationalist, was no longer fully in control of the mainland China because he was fighting the civil war with the communists, with Mao, and he was steadily losing. And ultimately, in 1949, he loses and flees to Taiwan and establishes a fairly brutal dictatorial regime in Taiwan, brings over about two million uh, of his nationalist supporters that control the country until the 1990s when Taiwan transitions to democracy. And what's happening today is that the Taiwanese society um, in the last 30 years after embracing democracy really started to get interested in its culture, in its history, uh, its indigenous history as well. And even though today the vast majority of the people are Han Chinese, about 70 percent of them trace their bloodlines to the indigenous population and are actually very proud of that. There's interest in indigenous population culture and uh, art and food and so forth. And um, as a result of that rediscovery, there's been a pushback uh, on the previous position of the Chinese nationalists that we are part of China because Chiang Kai-shek, who, you know, before World War II certainly had uh, much of the control of China, still harbored uh, the desires to take over the mainland once again and to control China. Of course, he did not want to take the position that Taiwan is separate from that, uh, right? It would go counter to his objectives and, and much of his supporters had the same. But nowadays, in the, in the last 30 years, that's been dramatically changing where more and more people realize we're not taking over China. And frankly, more and more people are saying we d don't want to take over China because we've got our own thing going and our own culture, our own history. And nowadays, the support for unification with China amongst the Taiwanese public, based on the latest polls, is around 7 percent and dropping precipitously. Right. And it's not even clear if you ask some of those people, the 7 percent that are for unification, what they actually mean by unification, because a number of them are certainly still those diehard national supporters who think that they're going to take over the mainland. That's what unification means. Not that the uh, Chinese uh, communists would take over the Taiwan. Right. So, so but the point is that there's virtually no one in the Taiwanese political system that really desires unification, that wants unification. And it's not just because they see what happens in Hong Kong with oppression there that's taking place or they see what happens to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang and they're saying, no, thanks. We're not really loving concentration camps. It's also because they're very proud of their culture. They're sort of like Canadians, right? Uh, you know, we might think, and I do certainly as an American, that this is the best country in the world, but Canadians don't want to be part of the American, don't want to be the 51st state because they're proud of their culture, their history, et cetera. And I believe that's the Taiwanese, that even if China was the model Jeffersonian democracy of the world, the beacon of freedom, that the Taiwanese would want nothing to do with it because, again, they're focused on their history uh, that is uh, distinct from Chinese history and, and their own culture, and, and they want to have their own nation. And, and they believe they do have their own nation. In fact, the official position of the ruling party, the DPP, is that we're not going to declare independence because we're already independent. You know, you don't see nations out there every day declaring independence if they're already independent, right? There, there's no yeah. point to that. And they certainly believe that. Today's episode of Change Agents is brought to you by Onyx Off-Road. Now, some of you may have heard the term Onyx before in regards to hunting. Same company, different app, different utilization. This is specifically Onyx Off-Road. And if you like getting off the beaten path, if you like exploring where others may not like to go, then you are gonna love Onyx Off-Road. It's the ultimate GPS navigation app for adventurers. When I turn this thing on, where I live up here in Kalispell, it lights up with available trail options that quite frankly, I never would be able to, probably because I don't have the time to find and explore on my own. So with Onyx Off-Road, you can find open trails that are near you, even without cell service. And unlike Google, Onyx has real humans mapping the trails, providing detailed information on trail difficulty, descriptions, pictures, and more. So whether you're looking for rock crawling areas or checking if your trailer could make it to a dispersed camping location, Onyx Off-Road has you covered. Plus, you can explore both public lands and private properties confidentially, meaning you can look at them through the app. You can start your adventure with a seven-day free trial and experience the difference yourself. Download Onyx Off-Road today and elevate your off-roading experience. I mean, it seems fair for a country and a people to want their own identity. I can't blame them for that. As a matter of fact, like you said, I fully support that. I live in the 
tip of northwestern Montana. I interface with Canadians all the time. They love coming down and raiding our target, but they also love to go back to their home because they're super proud of it, and they should be because it's a beautiful, beautiful country. Uh, What got you interested in this topic? Well, I I spent my career, early parts of my career, in the technology space and cybersecurity. I founded one of the largest cybersecurity companies in the world called CrowdStrike. And uh, the focus of the company was really, and why we started, was really these nation state threat actors that would hack into American companies, American government agencies, and steal our intellectual property, national secrets. And the vast majority of the attacks that we were seeing at CrowdStrike were from China. Mm -hmm. In fact, I broke the story on the first big intrusion from China back in 2020 of Google and about two dozen other companies and defense, technology, uh, uh, chemical manufacturing, and other industries where they were stealing this intellectual property by the truckloads. In fact, I I coined a term back then uh, that said that we're witnessing the greatest transfer of wealth in history that we're letting happen because we're not confronting China on what they're doing, which is basically uh, a mercantilist trade uh, policy driven country that is not playing by the rules, whether it's by stealing intellectual property and hacking all these companies or engaging in a fair competition, doing subsidies over capacity and so forth and destroying American industry. And I've been beating the drum on this for the last 15 years and particularly in the last four years, since uh, retiring from the technology sector, at least full time, and focusing on the national security uh, element, really warning about the rise of China, warning about what I believe is a new Cold War with China that we're engaged in that we absolutely have to win. Uh, and in 2021, as, as I was sort of very much focused on China and chi- uh, policy vis-a-vis China, I was sort of still keeping one eye on Russia. It was a country where I was born. And, and know very well and uh, have watched Putin very closely over the years. And I became convinced in December of 2021, and it came out publicly at the time, and said, this guy is going to invade Ukraine before the end of this winter, about three months before the invasion took place. I was one of the first geopolitical analysts to do so. And the causes, uh, the, the, the reasons that convinced me for why he was going to invade Ukraine, I realized were completely transferable to the Indo-Pacific. And that's when I really started writing the book. Uh, because I, I think that we are on a path to China trying to invade Taiwan in the next 48 years. I believe 2028 through 2032 is going to be an incredibly dangerous period. And the implications of that for the United States, I think, are completely un- unappreciated by much of the American public. The stakes are way, way higher than Ukraine. Taiwan matters a lot more to us than Ukraine does mm-hmm. uh, for a huge re- number of reasons, both hardcore national security and power projection, but also economic reasons, because Taiwan, of course, is the epicenter of microelectronics and chips manufacturing, which drives the modern economy and letting China either destroy it or uh, even worse, take over it is going to be absolutely devastating to America and our own uh, economic security. So for for all those and, and many other reasons, I believe that we are a world on the brink, as, as the book calls it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but unlike Russia and Ukraine, um, I think it's not too late to try to deter it because invading Taiwan is a very, very difficult proposition. Um, and this island truly is a natural fortress and, and one of the worst places you can think of invading. Of course, Chinese have been focused on this singular mission for the last 40 years, the military has been. And, uh, you know, the, the, we know now from the U.S. intelligence community estimates that have been um, uh, publicized that the, the President Xi has given the order to the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, to be ready for invasion by 2027. It doesn't mean that he will invade in 27. I think actually 27 itself is very unlikely um, for the invasion to take place. But sometime afterward, I think uh, he may very well do it. What is it that you were seeing about Putin in Russia that led you to be able to call it so early before other people were paying attention? So beyond the obvious factors, and I was watching this buildup on the borders of Ukraine that was taking place, that was, um, we've had other military buildups that he's undertaken both earlier that year and even in in, uh, uh, early 2021, but also in years prior. But this was um, done on a totally different scale. But then looking at his rhetoric, looking at what was happening in Russia, I realized that there were five factors that would drive him to do that. The first one was history and his own distorted view of history. And he's written extensively on that, including about six months before he invaded in July of 2021, when he, he basically wrote this long, uh, almost uh, PhD style essay on why um, 
uh, Ukraine is not a country and has always belonged to Russia. And you saw that even hmm. in his Tucker Carlson interview where he went on for 30 minutes talking about what happened in the 800s and, and so forth. But he's very much convinced that this is uh, a mistake of history to, to have uh, allowed Ukraine to declare independence and it needs to be corrected. It was, Second, Im- it was impressive on Tucker Carlson. Believe the man, not believe the man. He went on a pretty impressive rant. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And and uh, Tucker, I think, thought he was filibustering, but I don't think so. He was very convinced of his arguments, yes. and he wanted to lay it out there for the world to see. And he's done it not just on his show, but in other four as well. The second one is destiny, that he believes it is Russia's destiny, but also his own personal destiny, because he sees himself as the new Peter the Great that expanded the Russian Empire, created the city of St. Petersburg that, uh, of course, Putin hails from. Um to expand the Russian Empire, or at least restore it to uh, some of its former glory. And Ukraine has always been um, that vital piece of the Russian Empire, in his view, the breadbasket, the buffer state that um, protects Russia against invasions, uh, and uh, that this was his time, right? And and the timing is really, really matters here, because Putin is now in his 70s, early 70s. So he's looking at the last potentially decade of his power, uh, you know, both his mortality as well as hold on power and very keenly aware of his own legacy and the need to establish that. The third one is security. And, you know, there's a lot of people that debate how much NATO expansion caused this war or didn't cause this war. And, and people sort of taking very radical position on both sides that it was either the singular cause or had no role to play whatsoever. I'm in the middle on this, that I think that it's wrong to say that it had no role to play whatsoever. It's also wrong to say that it was the only thing that caused it. And the, the reason is that, uh, first, for the most basic reasons, that Putin does want to control Ukraine. And if Ukraine is a part of NATO, it eliminates that optionality for him to invade it and control it, right? Because now you would be confronting NATO. So on that premise alone, that Ukraine joining NATO would prevent him from controlling the country, um, he was opposed to, to the NATO expansion to Ukraine. But also, there are legitimate security concerns, historic security concerns that Russia has had with having potential um, adversarial military alliances on its border. Russia has been invaded, obviously, numerous times through its history, Napoleon, Hitler, Teutonic Knights, Polish uh, invading forces and the like. And many of those invasions have gone through Ukraine on the path to Moscow. And Ukraine has always served as a critical buffer state to give them time to mobilize and protect the capital, at least um, uh, against Hitler. They failed uh, in the case of Napoleon. Uh, but, but that time to mobilize and, 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 and having that strategic depth was always essential for Russia's security. So I believe for both uh, offensive and defensive reasons, uh, both the control of Ukraine reasons as well as projecting power into Europe, uh, if you have Ukraine, it makes it a lot easier. And then defending it against other invasions, Ukraine uh, served an important security role for Russia. And then geography, right? Uh, that uh, it is this huge breadbasket. Uh, there's a lot of uh, natural resources in Ukraine, particularly coal, some gas, uh, a lot of agricultural production, um, and it's uh, you know that critical buffer state as well. And the last piece that is probably the most important of the reasons. Uh, why I think Putin wanted to invade Ukraine is ego. And hmm. that it's not enough for him to say that one day Russia will invade Ukraine, will control Ukraine. He wants to be the one to do it. He wants to get credit for it, to go down in the history books as a great Russian leader, to borrow a phrase, the, the guy that made Russia great again. He's really <laughs> believing that, right? And, and when you look at those, those five reasons, history, destiny, security, geography, ego, all those same uh, causes play out in the Indo-Pacific. Xi does not believe that Taiwan is a country. He believes it's his destiny and the Communist Party destiny to take Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is essential for the security of China. We can talk about why. And it's critical um, anchor point of, of the first island chain uh, and the geography of that. But also ego, that she, like Putin, views himself as a great Chinese leader. He wants to be the one that eclipses Mao that did the one thing that Mao could never do, which is take Taiwan, go down into the history books as the person that unified, in his view, China and achieved uh, what he calls Chinese nations rejuvenation, right? Uh, that would be the ultimate coup in his cap and, uh, and, and cement his legacy. So it's remarkable how similar those people are and how they're driven by the same factors. What do you make of it that they recently met? 
Well, they, they have a very uh, friendly relationship. You know, um, they declared right before the war that they have a friendship without limits. And uh, she gives bear hugs to Putin anytime <laughs> he sees him. But, but I think it's also important not to overestimate uh, that relationship. From China's perspective, certainly, and to some extent even from Russia's, it's a very transactional relationship. And uh, it's telling that out of the this al uh, alliance of disruptors or agents of chaos, as they're sometimes called, the four nations that we've been dealing with for decades now, Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, um, that China is the only one that is not providing military aid to Russia, right? Iran is shipping uh, drones. Uh, North Koreans are providing missiles and artillery. China is only doing sort of non-lethal, some dual-use capabilities like semiconductors, and not even officially, but mostly through allowing the black market uh, to emerge to, 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 to help Russia. So it is very cognizant that it does not want to be sanctioned and uh, fall prey of export controls from the West, and it will not lift a finger for Russia unless it thinks it's in its own interest. You've seen what we've been able to do with the Navy SEAL Foundation in the past. We've done campaigns, films, and tons of other awesome content. Our latest Ironclad original, On the X, is made in partnership with the Foundation. We are really excited about this weekly podcast and YouTube show. One of the debut episodes we're really excited to have on best-selling author and podcaster Malcolm Gladwell. Another example of, of a guest, Matt Frazier, who's won five CrossFit championships, or a uh, big wave surfer and kind of wellness advocate, Laird Hamilton. Both those guys have really pushed the limits of their sports, and it's a perfect sort of uh, example of what we want to try to do with this show. If you were a betting man, how would you, what would you put your money on how the Ukraine war plays itself out? Look, unfortunately, this conflict, uh, since really April of 2022, uh, two months after the invasion, a month and a half after the invasion, has turned into a war of attrition, right? Mm -hmm. When the Russians failed to take Kiev, failed to accomplish the objective of changing the government and, and controlling the country, uh, it has deteriorated in this conflict where it's all about which side outlasts the other. And yeah, there's some territorial, minor territorial changes that are taking place. Russia continues its assaults. Ukraine uh, tried to retake some territory last year, but neither really has significant offensive capacity for huge operations. Uh, and um, they're just grinding away at each other. And uh, Putin hopes that you, he can wear out Ukraine, both um, that the West will tire from supporting it and giving it weapons, but, but also that uh, that that uh, the Ukrainians themselves would get tired. In particular, this year, he's really doubled down on destroying the uh, 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 energy sector in Ukraine. Um, and uh, he's targeted before, but this year he's really doubled down on it and uh, destroyed a lot of generation capacity. So they're in for a very, very tough winter coming up. Obviously, a lot of casualties. Economy is in shambles. Uh, so he's hoping he can wear them down. But on the other hand, uh, Russia is not a picnic either, and its economy is not in a great shape, even though uh, ostensibly its GDP is growing. It's only growing because of military Keynesians, where you know, GDP, of course, measures the um, uh, production uh, uh, that, that takes place in your country. And Russia is producing a lot of artillery shells, a lot of uh, munitions and missiles and the like, but you know, they're immediately expending them in Ukraine. So it's not a, a economically desirable form of GDP growth and doesn't ultimately uh, help um, grow the Russian uh, um, uh, wealth and, and prosperity. And of course, they're losing many of their young people and they're, they're both they're dying and getting maimed in Ukraine. Um, that's gonna be a significant drag on their economy going forward, both in terms of the population loss um, uh, as well as uh, the healthcare costs and PTSD issues that they're going to be facing from this terrible war. So, you know, unfortunately, I think it, it can go on for quite some time. And whichever side, you know, loses its will or ability to keep prosecuting this war is ultimately uh, going to end up losing it. Switching it back over to uh, China, you mentioned in your book, or you make the case that we're already in the midst of a Cold War with China. What do you mean by that? And how deep do you think we are into that Cold War? So, you know, I, I've been convinced that we're in a Cold War with China for quite some time, 
but when I sat down to write this book, and there's quite a bit of history in this book about the first Cold War, even I was struck by the similarities between the two conflicts because my assumption going in has always been it's a Cold War, but it's very, very different from the first Cold War in part because of the economic integration between China and the United States. And doing the deep uh, research on the first Cold War, it was striking to me how uh, you had so much economic integration, even with Soviet Union throughout the first Cold War that I think many people do not appreciate. But let me just run you through a few similarities. So first of all, and this is obvious to anyone just looking at the surface of this issue, you have a global competition for supremacy that is playing out between the United States and China in every corner of the world, not just in the Asia Pacific, uh, but in Europe, in Latin America, in Africa, uh, you name it, right? And it's playing out in the military sphere, in the economic sphere, in the trade sphere, in the technology sphere, in the diplomatic sphere, in every single uh, way, similar to the confrontation that we had with the Soviet Union for much of the Cold War. Secondly, you have an arms race. Both countries are building up their arsenals for this fight, preparing for this conflict. You know, I just met with Admiral Papara, who's the head of Indopaycom recently, and, uh, you know, his command in Hawaii is preparing for war, right? It, it, it is absolutely striking. Even though most Americans are not thinking about war with China, the military, and particularly folks in Indopaycom, absolutely are. And what's interesting is that the arms race is not just conventional, but it's also nuclear. Um, the Chinese in particular have uh, struck um, uh, this path on a huge buildup of their nuclear arsenal. So for many, many decades since they became really a nuclear power, they've had about a steady number of 300 nuclear warheads. They're now building it up massively, both uh, the warheads themselves as, that, as well as additional missile silos. And uh, they're trying to get by U.S. intelligence community estimates to or, over 1,000 by the end of the decade and potentially match America around 1,500 warheads by the mid-2030s. Uh, uh, you have a space race, right? One of the defining characteristics of the first Cold War was the race to the moon in the 1960s, yep. which we, of course, won. Guess what we're doing now? We're trying to get back to the moon before the Chinese do and then on to Mars. Uh, remarkably similar. Uh, you have economic warfare in terms of tariffs that President Trump first instituted, Biden continued <clears throat> and increased. Uh, and and uh, uh, our allies is, are increasingly joining in on that with the Europeans instituting tariffs on electric vehicles from China. You have an ideological struggle. There it's a little bit different from the first Cold War because I think it's less about communism versus capitalism because both countries really arguably are um, variants of uh, capitalism uh, or even uh, – uh, you know, the, the the types of ideological struggles that were playing out in the first Cold War, but but it's certainly authoritarians versus democracy. And it's not an accident that she is cozying up to dictators like Putin and even uh, Orban, the most authoritarian leader in Europe, uh, and, and trying to reinforce that alliance. Uh, and he's exporting that ideology as well. Uh, so the Chinese have opened up in recent years schools in Africa to train future African leaders in surveillance technology, population control technology, uh, to help institute those authoritarian uh, uh, dictatorships. Not necessarily communist dictatorships in, in, in the traditional sense of the word, uh, but because they, they're less, they care less about the specific ideological alignment, but certainly dictatorial authoritarian regimes. You have a major regional flashpoint. So I argue in the book that Taiwan is really the new West Berlin. And a lot of people remember the Cuban Missile Crisis as sort of the defining most dangerous moment of the Cold War. Yep. And it certainly was that, but people have forgotten that there was another moment that was just as dangerous and was actually even longer in scope, and that was the West Berlin Crisis. Uh, it started uh, right after World War II with the confrontation between the Soviets and, and the Americans and the Berlin airlift that Truman instituted in 1948, but it continued through 1961 and the summer of 1961 was an incredibly dangerous period, right? So the Cuban Missile Crisis was 13 days in October of 1962. Uh, half of that time, Americans didn't even know it was happening until Kennedy announced it to the world. But in 1961, uh, the year begins with the Kennedy inauguration, the Bay of Pigs disaster. And Kennedy really wanted a better relationship with the Soviet Union, wanting a detente. He writes a letter. Uh, to Khrushchev um, to ask for a summit. They have that summit in Vienna in June of 1961. And Kennedy comes in with this agenda of we should not be in this uh, ideological confrontation. Let's find you know, a reasonable um, way to accommodate each other's interests. And Khrushchev wants none of it. And 
he, he's got one priority and one priority only, which is to kick America out of West Berlin and, and, and its allies. And it, he gives an ultimatum to Kennedy that unless you leave, I'm going to invade. And Kennedy is shocked. He leaves the summit completely shaken up, thinks that Khrushchev is a madman, and he goes on American television and announces to the country that we're going to be preparing for war. And he articulates that we're going to defend West Berlin, even though it's this tiny enclave of freedom uh, surrounded by East Germany, very, very difficult to defend, but we're going to defend it to the end, including risking nuclear confrontation. In fact, he announces to the public to prepare for nuclear war. He asks Congress to allocate money to identify fallout shelters across the country. I mean, just remarkable, um, scary times, right? And it went on for weeks and weeks throughout the whole summer. And in mid-August, Kennedy's woken up one day and he's told that the East Germans have started building the wall, obviously on behalf of the, of the Soviets. And you know what he says? He says, thank God. Remarkable response, right? Because 25 years later, you have President Kennedy saying, Mr. Gorbachev, take down this wall. But Kennedy celebrates it. And he says, you know, it's not a great solution, but it's better than war. And uh, uh, if he is building the wall, Khrushchev, then he's not invading. And ironically, that wall stabilized the conflict and allowed us to get to detente in the 1970s and arms control agreements under Nixon and Ford and so forth because it signifies the end of Soviet expansionism, that they've basically agreed that they would control East um, Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, but they would no longer try to attempt to conquer by force Western Europe. And, and the Berlin Wall was kind of that, um, that border um, that was built both in a physical sense and in a, in a symbolic sense. And Taiwan is really that crisis right now, right? And if we could build, obviously, a metaphorical wall across the Taiwan Strait, and prevent invasion uh, of Taiwan by China, then we could actually stabilize the Cold War. It wouldn't end. We still have this global competition for supremacy that plays out in every corner of the world. But Taiwan is really that one place where we might go to war with China over because of, of the critical um, reasons uh, why Taiwan is important to us. There's no other place where we would confront China. Just like in the first Cold War, there was really no prospect that we would fight the Soviets over anything other than Berlin and, and Cuba briefly, mm -hmm. right? We wouldn't fight them in Vietnam. We wouldn't fight them in, in Korea. Um, they didn't. They certainly had no no appetite for that. Um, or really, uh, you know, when they invaded Afghanistan, we weren't going to fight them for that. Uh, but Berlin was essential. Uh, Kennedy believed, and Truman and Eisenhower, uh, for U.S. credibility, for U.S. projection of power in in Europe, and Taiwan is that today. And we're not gonna fight China for some rocks in South China Sea that are disputed or East China Sea. Taiwan is really that one place where you could go to war and it's an incredibly dangerous period. So for all those reasons, the two conflicts are remarkably similar. And the one reason that people give for why this is not a Cold War is this economic trade that is uh, enormous between the United States and China. And as I write in the book, we actually had a lot of economic connections to the Soviet Union. I'll just give you a few examples. You may remember during much of the Cold War, you had these black Volga limousines that the Soviet leaders would drive through Red Square during their uh, parades. Those came out of a factory that was built by who? Drum roll, Henry Ford. They came over to the Soviet <laughs> Union uh, and built a factory to first produce tractors that was later converted to an automobile factory, later nationalized. Uh, if you're following the Ukraine war closely, you may remember that in the spring of 2022, there was this big fight in the city of Mariupol that the, the Russians were conquering, and the Ukrainian defenders were holed up in this massive steel factory called Azovstal in Ukraine, one of the largest in the world, and, and they um, held out there for many, many weeks before they surrendered. Well, that factory is an exact copy of a factory in Gary, Indiana, which at the time was the largest in the world, and American industrials came over to the Soviet Union to help build a steel factory for Stalin, because why wouldn't you want Stalin to produce steel so he can build tanks and aircraft and uh, ships and, and the like? Uh, so incredible uh, myopic uh, decision-making uh, in the early stages of the Cold War, we were enabling the Soviet Union, literally arming them. Uh, there's another incredible story where in 1946 and 47, this is after the Churchill speech, in uh, Fulton, Missouri, where he has declared an Iron Curtain falling across Eastern Europe uh, after the National Security Act of 1947 that established the CIA, and we're fully in the midst of a Cold War. Everyone knows this. And the Soviets are trying to produce their first jet fighter, the MiG-15. 
And uh, the trade minister, uh, who happens to be the brother of the uh, Mikoyan, the constructor of the of the MiG, goes to Stalin and says, we're having trouble with the engines, the reliability of the engines. We've taken all these designs from Germany after World War II, but we can't quite get the reliability right. And we would like your permission to approach the British to see if they would sell us the Rolls-Royce engines. And Stalin is incredulous. He's like, which fool is going to sell you their secrets? But, you know, <laughs> no harm in trying. Give it a shot. They, they approach the British. And the British, the Labour Party that, that has just won the election there after World War II, is happy to sell them the Rolls-Royce engines. They get quickly reverse engineered, incorporated in the MiG-15. Uh, and three years later, those MiG-15s shoot down 139 Americans over the skies of Korea. Right? Remarkably myopic decision making. And even throughout 60s and 70s, much of the oil and gas technology of the Soviet Union, which of course is financing the regime, financing the arms race, financing the space race, is running off Western technology that is sold to them, not even stolen. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, President Reagan in particular in the 1980s is trying to stop Wall Street banks and other banks in Western Europe from giving loans to Warsaw Pact countries, which were essential for sustaining their economies. Uh, unsuccessfully, by the way. So uh, this is remarkable. The scale is very, very different. Obviously, the, the relationship with China is unprecedented in history in terms of overall ec economic uh, trade uh, between two countries. But uh, it's changing now, and there's decoupling that's taking place in select industries like semiconductors, uh, EVs, batteries, et cetera, and a rebalancing that's occurring. So for all those reasons, I believe we're in a Cold War. Ladies and gentlemen, this episode of Change Agents is brought to you by Montana Knife Company. If you are a fan of the show, if you've tuned in before, you've probably heard me talking about them. They are an American-made brand. Actually, just down the road from where I'm at right now, about 100, eh, I'll call it 120 miles away down in Frenchtown, is a man named Josh Smith, the founder of Montana Knives. And if you're a hunter, you've definitely heard about him. My favorite, my go-to actually in my... Uh, pack somewhere in this room is the mini speed goat you're probably aware that they have a culinary line they have a line that you could use for skinning for filet and every use in the backcountry but what you don't know is that on july 11th they're going to have a tactical line the first line or the first knife in that line is going to be called the war goat i wish i had one to show you but that's how far into production they are right now i don't even have one to hold up for you to see when I do, you're definitely gonna see it. And if it's anything like the other knives that Josh and Montana Knife Company make, you can be guaranteed it's gonna serve every purpose that they claim it will. Go to montananifecompany.com to check out what they have to offer. Good luck getting one of these things when they come available because man, they go fast. So be prepared and be on the lookout. When I woke up, very confused, she said, you almost died last night. In fact, no one can believe you were alive. Change is very scary. As humans, we just hate uncertainty. My name is Chris Irwin. I'm a SEAL veteran and the communications director for the Navy SEAL Foundation, one of the nation's leading nonprofits. I went into the games not knowing what was coming. You just sensed that it was out there. It was like they'd been hit by a nuclear bomb. Now in our new podcast, I'm speaking with renowned scientists, world-class practitioners, best-selling authors, elite athletes, and others who help shape our way of thinking and what we do. You have to start somewhere. We're all programmed in this world to push ourselves even farther. Almost always some degree of growth that's available to us if we are very intentional about it. This is first-hand knowledge at the very center of topics that can change your life. My experience with the world is that if you try and do something hard and you give it your best shot, people are unbelievably accepting of the result. This is On The X, an Ironclad original. Subscribe on YouTube at This Is Ironclad or wherever you get your podcasts. Why do you estimate 2028 and beyond would be the optimal time period for Chinese to invade or for China to invade, I should say? So great question. So today they're not ready. So they've been building up this capability for a singular mission to invade Taiwan. And, and look, when you look at sort of a spreadsheet comparison of the U.S. military and the Chinese military, it's not even close. We are more powerful in every respect in terms of global power projection, uh, 
air capabilities, naval capabilities, you name it, right? They have two aircraft carriers, a third one on the way. We have 11. Our aircraft carriers do not even match, um, you know, uh, are, are so overmatching in terms of theirs. It's, it's not even, a, uh, you know, a fair comparison. But they've built a military and they've been focused on building a military for a single purpose, which is to invade this island of Taiwan, which is right next uh, to their shores, right 100 miles off their shores. We've been building a military to basically try to fight any foe at any time, anywhere else in the world. And as a result, our capabilities are highly distributed and uh, you know, we have land forces to fight you know, war with the Russians in Europe. Uh, we've been fighting counterterrorism battles in the Middle East and so forth. So we've kind of dropped our eye off the ball uh, in the Indo-Pacific, and the balance of power in the Taiwan Strait has now shifted quite a bit, where it is now for the first time really ever since the establishment of the PRC in 1949 for the Chinese to potentially have a successful invasion of Taiwan. Uh, it's still a very difficult proposition, still uncertain, uh, but they're getting closer and closer to having that capability. Um, again, like U.S. military in any other scenario would overmatch the Chinese military easily, right? If you were talking about a hypothetical naval battle, let's say in the Atlantic Ocean, it wouldn't even be close or land war in Africa or whatever. Like the Chinese just couldn't do it. But this specific mission mm -hmm. of, you know, uh, conquering Taiwan, they're getting close. They're not yet there. And, you know, she has given an order to be ready by 27. Doesn't mean that that order will be uh, fulfilled uh, because we certainly know that with any government agency, whether it's in America or China, just because you tell them to be ready by a certain date doesn't mean that they actually will be. But the intent is certainly there and the, and the push and the investments are, are there. Um, 27, I think, is unlikely to be the day of the year of the invasion. Uh, a, I don't, I don't think they'll actually meet his timeline for being ready by 27, but also 27 is sort of an election year for him. It's uh, his reelection to another term, which he's likely to win, but you know he still needs to do the effort. Uh, he, he doesn't have an election across the Chinese populace. It's not a democracy, but there is election inside the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, he's mostly instituted loyalists across the party, but there's still some pockets of resistance to him. The economy is not going well. He's uh, alienated so many people around the world. The relationship with the United States is, is, is uh, going from bad to worse. So. He's almost certainly going to win, but he needs to put a little bit of effort into it. And there's a lot of, you know, campaigning, if you will, inside the party that takes place, a lot of ideological pronouncements. So it's like us launching a war during our election year. It's not a great time, right? There's yeah. a lot of things happening. You're busy. Uh, you don't want to do it. So you want to get through that uh, 2027. And part of 2028 is also going to be occupied with sort of the new administration, obviously, almost certainly will be him, but he'll put new people in place, new ideology, new five-year plans. So there's quite a bit of bureaucratic work that's taking place. You kind of get past all that in the second half of 2028, where I think the window opens. And also, if you look at us, 2028 is going to be very, very busy for us. Mm -hmm. The year begins with a Taiwanese election, potentially change of government there that would occur in May of 2028, the inauguration of a new president. The summer of 2028 is the Olympics in Los Angeles. So, you know, the American public is going to be focused on that, not uh, not what's happening in Asia. And then, of course, you've got the election in, in, in November of 2028 and potentially lame duck administration, depending on who wins uh, this time around. So so we're distracted. The Taiwanese are distracted, new administration, et cetera. And China gets through its distraction, potentially is ready and the window opens up. And I think it actually closes in 2032, at least in Xi's mind, because in 2032, his term is up and he's going to be 79. And unlike our system, they don't tend to elect uh, old men to, uh, <laughs> uh, to positions of power uh, and uh, very uncertain that he could get another term at that point. Uh, the Chinese economy is not likely to get any better. They've got very big systematic issues taking place. Uh, but also, you know, he's going to be thinking about his own mortality. Uh, and uh, if you want to go down into history books, you, you know, th this is the window. And the other piece of this is that the longer he waits, the worse it gets, because we are now and really for the last eight years or so have woken up to the threat and started investing. But it takes time to build up capabilities, things like AUKUS, our partnership with Australia to build and the UK to build submarines. Those submarines will start popping up in, in the late 2030s. The investments that Taiwan is making, Japan is making, the Philippines are making. It's going to take time, but in 2030s, you're going to have a lot of this stuff coming online. 
and that balance of power will shift once again. So the longer he waits, the worse it gets, right? This is potentially the window, both from a military capability perspective, his own legacy, his own destiny to do something. He waits too long, he may die, he may lose power ultimately or not get uh, another term, and the window closes from a military perspective as well. What do you estimate the U.S. response would be? Look, I argue in the book that this is really, really vital for U.S. interests. And let me let me explain why. So China, I believe, is a major threat. We've talked about how we're in the new Cold War. And the key to, to making sure that this Cold War stays cold is to keep China contained. And right now they're geographically contained because when they look out at the world, and this is why Taiwan is so important to them, uh, not just because of the history and destiny piece, but their geography is really terrible because if they look out to their east, what do they see? They see the Korean Peninsula, half of which is South Korea, 28,000 American troops there, radar installations, air bases, naval bases. Further down, you have the Japanese islands, uh, headquarters of the Seventh Fleet, Marines, Marines in Okinawa, the uh, really growing and, and quite good capabilities of the Japanese self-defense forces as well. And then in the uh, center of that first island chain, facing much of China, is this island of Taiwan, viewed as an outpost of U.S. power. And then closing down the arc of the Philippines, where once again, for the first time in 32 years, American forces are getting access to the Filipino military bases. So if you're China, you see yourself completely contained by American allies and American bases, right? Not what you want to see if you think that you're going to be the world's greatest superpower, which yeah. is their objective. Um, and it's, a, it's their stated objective because they think that they are deserve to be the world's preeminent power, which they had been for much of human history. For much of human history, China was the richest country, most populous country, uh, most powerful country. And it's only since the advent of the Industrial Revolution that, that they lost that place first to Europe and now to America. So they see this as just uh, uh, getting back into their rightful place in the world, um, being the number one power. Well, you can't do that if you're completely surrounded. And if you trade with the world, both your imports and they import a lot of energy, a lot of food, uh, goes through the choke points, the naval choke points that can be controlled by the US Navy. Um, if your exports, and you're of course an export dependent economy, can be shut down by a US blockade, you can't let that happen, right? And Taking Taiwan allows them to break out of that first island chain and really dominate East Asia and push the U.S. out because our presence there with Taiwan captured would be untenable. And the reason it would be untenable is that if you look at the waters, um, the depth of the waters near Chinese shores, both on the South China Sea and East China Sea, uh, it's very, very shallow. Just to give you a sense, in the Taiwan Strait, the depth of the waters is about 300 feet, uh, too shallow to even operate a submarine safely. On the other side of Taiwan, on the eastern side, they drop down to 12,000 feet, right? A remarkable drop off and then goes down further from there because, uh, of course, the Pacific is the world's deepest ocean. So right now, when the Chinese subs and their surface ships are leaving the Chinese ports in South China Sea or East China Sea, they have to go through these choke points in the first island chain uh, you know, between Taiwan and the Philippines or between Taiwan and Japan, uh, very, very shallow. Uh, choke points can be fully controlled by U.S. allies and U.S. Navy, and that limits your ability to project power. If you take Taiwan and you build military bases on that deep side of Taiwan, um, then you uh, and you build missile bases, etc., then you threaten the U.S. naval forces in Japan and the U.S. Marines there, uh, U.S. forces in the Philippines. You really make it unsustainable for us to operate there in the event of conflict. You push us all the way back to Hawaii, um, and you dominate that region. It doesn't mean that they're gonna go on a uh, Hitlerian invasion spree and take Japan or Philippines or whatever, but they don't need to to bully them around and to threaten them just like Russia threatens its neighbors, right? Um, you know, much of Central Asia is within Russia's sphere of influence, for example, not because they're invading them, but because they know that they don't have a choice. America's far away, can't help them. China doesn't seem interested either. And when Russia says jump, they have to say how high. And that will be Japan, that will be Korea, that will be uh, Philippines. Uh, uh, that will be one of the most important regions of the world where you have uh, about half of the world's GDP, most of the supply chains, most of the economic growth. If China dominates that region and sets the rule of trade and security, um, that will be a diminishment of U.S. economic power, diminishment of, for U.S. national security, and will be a more powerful China that is now uncorked, and uh, it will not stop, of course, at East Asia, but uses a platform to project power, 
uh, across the world, uh, in Latin America, in our own neighborhood, in Europe, and et cetera. And it'll be a decline of U.S. power. It'll be a rise of Chinese power. And traditionally, when that's happened, uh, whether it's Germany or Japan in the 1940s um, or 1914, you inevitably have conflict, right? And uh, a more powerful China is a much dire threat to the United States from a conflict perspective over time as well. So this Taiwan is really that key battleground that if you prevent them, deter them ideally from taking it, then you can keep them contained and you allow their economy to stagnate on its own. They've already hit middle income trap. Their growth rates are about the same as ours, three, four uh, percent. Their economy is 25 percent smaller. So at that rate, they will never catch up with us. Uh, contained geographically, the decoupling that's occurring, at least partial decoupling uh, and the demographics collapse that they are going to go uh, under or go, go through uh, in the rest of the century that is just absolutely staggering, right? They have about 1.4 billion people today. Uh, conservative projections are that they'll have about 550 million by the end of the century, uh, and much of that will be older population, right? Mm -hmm. So not a great trajectory at all uh, if you can keep them contained, if you can keep them from dominating East Asia and expanding their resources, economic resources, by, by setting the rules of, of trade in that region. And that's how you ultimately win the Cold War. If they do invade Taiwan, do you think it would kick off World War III? Well, it would kick off potentially if the U.S. chooses to fight for all the reasons I mentioned that I, that I think are important to us, uh, a very dangerous conflict, um, one that we have not seen really since World War II, potentially even our, uh, World War I or Civil War. You know, the estimates on the casualties we would sustain, thousands of American troops, uh, you know, within days could eclipse anything that we saw in a single day of combat in World War II. We lost about 2,000 Americans, 2,500, I think, um, uh, on D-Day, the deadliest um, conflict uh, day of, uh, of the conflict for us during World War II. You know, if one aircraft carrier is sunk, that's 5,000 Americans that will be dead instantly, yeah. right? Um, so uh, really, really dramatic stakes, not to mention that China is a nuclear power. And uh, in any conflict with China, there'll be a discussion at least uh, because the military will really want to strike Chinese air bases to prevent the threat of Chinese um, fighter jets and bombers uh, from targeting our naval assets. And if you strike mainland China, well, guess what? They're gonna try to strike us, mm -hmm. our mainland. And you could have missiles, hopefully conventional missiles flying into our ports or air bases across the United States, certainly the Western uh, Pacific. And uh, who knows where where it goes from there. Very, very dangerous. So I don't know if it's a World War Three because I don't think that it'll play out in any part of the world. I don't think we'll be fighting China and you know Europe or Africa or whatever. They don't have that power projection capability, but it's gonna be incredibly dangerous in East Asia. And it could spur adventurism by others. Um, the North Koreans may decide that this is an optimal time to do something on the Korean Peninsula. Iranians may do something in the Middle East, Russia and Europe. So that is the risk. This week on Borderland, an ironclad original, Vince talks to journalist and cartel expert Chris Dolby about the Jalisco New Generation Cartel. The CJNG are the most sophisticated, consistent and systematic extortionists in the Mexican criminal landscape. Uh, the state of Jalisco is a famous ranching state, right? There's a lot of cattle there. Not only did ranchers have to pay a fee per head of cattle that they were selling, but the CJNG, because they control the local government or because they access state databases, they know if you're a farmer, how many states of cattle do you own? How much land do you have? How much profits did you bring in last year? How many taxes did you pay? And they will extort you based on that. It's a very carefully calculated extortion price. The extortion that we saw was 50% of profits, not revenue, profit. So whatever your take home pay, you're giving half of it away to them, right? Watch Borderland everywhere you get your podcasts and on YouTube at This Is Ironclad. For over two decades, our military has been engaged in the global war on terrorism. This means parents are currently sending their children off to fight in the same war that they did. The Global War on Terrorism Memorial Foundation is a nonprofit organization designated by Congress to plan, fund, and build the National Global War on Terrorism Memorial on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., next to the Vietnam Memorial and the World War II Memorial. The foundation is run by Michael Rodriguez, who has been deployed 10 times to serve our nation. And this year, his son deployed, just like he did. The mission of the foundation is clear. Build an inclusive memorial 
honoring all the uniform and non-uniform personnel who have served in the GWAT, which stands for Global War on Terror, as well as the civilians, family members, and other groups who have supported America's service members throughout the conflict. You can join this historic effort and honor the brave men and women defending our freedoms. The memorial is being funded 100% through private donations, and though the location is secured, the ground can only be broken once funds have been raised. So you can visit gwatmemorialfoundation.org to learn how you can be more involved. Whether you donate, buy merch, sign up for their newsletter, or just follow them on social media, your support matters. Join me in honoring those who have served our country these past two decades by visiting gwatmemorialfoundation.org today. I think I know the answer to this question, but I'll ask it. When you were working in cybersecurity and you identified the the attack and that theft of IP, how did the Chinese government respond to that accusation? Oh, they always deny it. <laughs> deny it and, like I said, and I thought I knew the answer to it, but I figured I'd ask anyway. <laughs> yeah, they counter accuse that the U.S. is you know doing all the spying, they cite Snowden, etc. So literally just yesterday, the U.S. Department of Justice, along with our allies, the Canadians, the Australians, Japanese, New Zealand, uh, UK uh, have uh, attributed uh, a range of intrusions to Chinese Ministry of State Security, kind of their version, kind of a, a blend of CIA and FBI because they do, both do espionage overseas, but also domestic suppression at home. And, uh, you know, Chinese always always say that this is not us and this is all fake news and so forth. What do they do with the IP that they steal? Is it, you know, technological IP? They leap forward ahead. Are they using it? You know, because there's a variety of, you know, there's state level attacks and then there's, you know, scammers on the Internet that target normal people like myself. Or my, I should say my father, because he is not uh, very savvy with what he does on the Internet. And I have to explain to him that there's no crown prince in Somalia that has uh, eight million dollars <laughs> in a bank account for him. You know, I, I can understand at a nation building level, you know, you can attack Google, you can attack the information, you know, infrastructure and steal technology but you have, I have to imagine that they're getting much more access than just those type of things. Do they just part and parcel it to these different organizations and they just use the information to the best of their ability? Yeah, so broadly speaking, there are three categories of threat actors operating in China. There's the Ministry of State Security that I mentioned, their primary civilian intelligence agency. There's the PLA, their military, that does a lot of cyber intrusions as well. And then there's a range of contractors, basically private companies that are operating basically as beltway bandits equivalent uh, in China where they have contracts with either the military or the intelligence services to do the work on behalf of them, but they also do quite a bit of moonlighting. So uh, a lot of cyber crime activity that you see emanating from China is actually coming from these companies that are have contracts to do national security espionage, either steal intellectual property and trade secrets from companies for the benefits of Chinese companies or steal national security secrets and give it to the Chinese government. Uh, but then they've built this capability, uh, this high-end capability to do these cyber intrusions. And they're sort of saying, well, you know, we might use it to benefit our, our own pockets, right? And we might uh, do ransomware operations to do extortion against companies, or we may steal data for just uh, our personal use and the like. So that cybercrime category of activity that is not necessarily state sanctioned, but uh, certainly the state looks the other way when they do it, uh, is is growing as well in China. Uh, but but the primary threat really is both this theft of um, the espionage, the theft of our secrets, military secrets, government secrets, but also the impact to our companies. Because you can't really compete against someone that's stealing all of your research, all of your trade secrets, your pricing information, your customer data. And I've been arguing about this very passionately, literally for 15 years. I remember having conversations, very heated conversation in the sit room of the White House back in 2010, 2011 time period where I was almost beating the table saying, guys, like this is happening to every major company. I coined a phrase back then that you may have heard of uh, uh, that basically said there are two types of companies out there, those that know that they've been hacked and those that don't yet know, <laughs> but they all have been hacked. And every industry, literally everything that's not bolted down, these guys are stealing. And the response I was getting at the time was, oh, as long as they're stealing, they can't innovate. We'll just, you know, outpace them and we'll keep innovating while they're stealing. I'm like, that is a so racist to think that the Chinese can't innovate as well. And obviously when you're stealing, it just helps your innovation because you know which research paths not to take, which ones don't pan out and accelerate your own. 
and, and, and two, it's just so myopic uh, to think that you can compete against someone who's playing unfairly. Like, you know, think about any sport where someone's cheating and you'll say, oh, we'll just, you know, work harder and train harder, even though they're doping all over the place and we'll win that way. Well, no, you're not going to win that way. You need 11 play, level playing play field or you're going to lose. And that's exactly what happened. You know, back then, you didn't really have any major Chinese companies dominating technology sectors. Now you do. Not just TikTok, but Huawei and Alibaba and BYD uh, car makers um, that, that are producing literally the best cars, electric cars in the world uh, and cheaper. Uh, guess what? A lot of that was based on stolen IP, but a lot of it's based, based on innovation because uh, the stolen IP allowed them to catch up yeah. a lot of these companies. And uh, then they invest in their research and development and, and leapfrogged us. And they're trying to do this in so many areas. And we are still to this day doing relatively little to confront them, relatively little to punish these companies that benefited from that intellectual property, sanction them, prevent them from exporting their goods, not just to our country, but to our allies as well. And that's what we need to do. We need to send a very clear message that if you're going to plan fairly, we're going to cut you off, right? This is what happens, let's say, in the Olympics when someone cheats. You know, the Russians started cheating uh, some years ago, uh, doping, and we banned you know, uh, their, their teams from competing. And now their um, athletes have to compete under the Olympic flag. They can't even um, use the Russian flag, right? So you, you got to institute those uh, repercussions uh, for Chinese companies that are benefiting from this theft. Dimitri, we're coming up to uh, the end of our time here. What do you want to leave the listeners with? And then what's the best way for them to find your book? So the book is available, you know, wherever you buy books, whether Amazon or uh, your, your favorite bookstores. Uh, it made the national bestseller list, and uh, it's called World on the Brink, How America Can Be China in the Race of the 21st Century. And what, what I want them to take away from is that we are in a very dangerous period that, that um, is getting more dangerous by the day. But it's not hopeless. And in fact, the book, despite its title, at least for the first part of the title, uh, is not uh, is not that ominous because it talks about the incredible strengths that we have in innovation, in access to capital. You know the types of com the type of company that I was able to build, which is now a part of the S and P five hundred, one of the largest cybersecurity companies in the world. Uh, I couldn't do anywhere else. Um, only in America because of the talent that we have, the education system, uh, the innovation base uh, that we have. Um, the, the military strengths that we've got, right? The advantages are just enormous. And the real question is, do we have the will to use those advantages to do the thing that I think is most vital for American foreign policy today, which is deter China from taking this action across the Taiwan Strait? Because if we manage to stop them from doing that, I think the century, the century remains ours uh, and China is on the decline. And we, we, I think, will have incredible potential, economic potential and so forth to really make sure that this century, like the last one, remains an American century. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you want to learn more about Dimitri and his work, the best location is going to be at X, formerly known as Twitter. I am not going to attempt to spell out his last name or his username, so please just click on the link in the show notes below. Thank you again for listening to Change Agents, an Ironclad original presented by Montana Knife Company. See you all next week with a brand new episode. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Change Agents. And now here's a special preview clip of our newest Ironclad original on the X with host Chris Irwin. I'm always been fascinated with about the kind of training you guys do, which is the element that is seems to come up again and again in your training, which is absent from other kind of training, is uh, fatigue. Mm. How much of what you guys do is about testing people at the limits of their endurance? Haven't been, haven't slept for X hours or have, I was reading some, I was reading some book and I think it was, I don't think it was Navy SEAL training. I think it was like one of the other elite, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Green Beret or something training. And you know, where you go on these sort of 48 hour hikes or whatever it is, and you're in the middle of nowhere. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all about dealing with the, you know, the degradation in cognitive and psychological performance yeah. at the edges of your physical that's what interests me. It's like, as you know this better than I do, 
you can be really good at something yeah. when you had a good night's rest and it's 11 in the morning and you've had your coffee. But that does not tell us <laughs> how, how you could be doing 12 hours later when you you had no, you had no food to eat and you've been right. That's yeah. interesting. Well, and it's it's why those selection courses you you can't just have a physical test and right and or draw blood or something and be like, oh, that's how we're going to pick things. You have to have a six month or whatever it may be a long crucible that that gets people to those depths, right? That deprives yeah. them of all those things that because that's the only way you you find out. There's just no. I, yeah. I just, I, there's no shortcut to it that I can think of. Yeah. And, but the challenge is, right? Like if you're, if you apply that at corporate America or something like, okay, well, how do you do that? Cause you can't, <laughs> you can't take people out and, and get them cold, wet and sandy for, for weeks or whatever like that to try and figure out their character to hire them. And that's, I think that's the real challenge. If you, if you put that emphasis on those things, instead of again, oh, he's got a great resume with tons of experience or whatever. It's like, well, let's, let's really get to the depth of this person's character. You know, how do you do that? I don't know. Maybe somebody out there can design some kind of, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it's an interesting experiment. To try to figure I always, out. I've said this many times. One of the things I always ask when I'm hiring assistants, my most important question is, do you drive a manual transmission? <laughs> and because, because I want to know, have you taken the time to master something that's not essential? Yeah. Right? Yep. Now you can get away with but we, but is is useful in certain extreme situations, right? You're stuck somewhere. That's the only car that's available, right? That's a little bit hard, right? That you know. And then people's answers. So there's many good answers. One answer is one guy, the best guy I ever hired. He was like, "Of course." And I was like, "Why? Uh, you know, you're like 21. Why would you know?" He goes, "Because I park cars for a summer." I'm like, "All right." Oh, there you go. Yeah, I'm on over. Yeah. yeah. And then the other good answer is no. But will you teach me how? Good. That's better. That's an even better answer. That's a good answer. I only yeah. got that once. Yep. Yeah.